Thanks for joining me here on Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I'm your host, Karen Fabian, the founder of Bare Bones Yoga. I'm a yoga teacher with over 15 years of experience, a certified personal trainer, and an entrepreneur. My mission is to help yoga teachers transform their teaching by mastering the fundamentals of anatomy. By learning anatomy in my easy step-by-step -step way, you'll be able to confidently share it in your cues, easily create sequences, and you'll eagerly answer student questions. And all along the way, you'll increase your impact and earning potential. On the podcast here, you will hear anatomy lessons, stories from teachers, interviews with others in the field, and a dose of personal development. Once you listen to today's episode, go ahead and visit barebonesyoga.com, my website, for free resource guides for teachers. Download any and all that are there, including one of my most popular tools, my sequence building template. And if you'd like, send me a one line email with the answer to this question. What's your biggest frustration right now as a yoga teacher? And I'm happy to do some brainstorming with you in a free coaching session. My email address is karen at barebonesyoga.com. Thanks for taking the time to listen today. Let's get to today's episode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I'm your host, Karen Fabian, and this is episode 174. So we are here on Monday, and as usual, I've got another episode for you all. This is going to be an interview episode. Last week, I did a solo. The weeks prior, I had a whole bunch of guests on. And this week, we've got a really cool guest talking about money management for yoga studio owners and also for yoga teachers, because many of the concepts we're going to talk about also relate to independent yoga teachers in helping them manage their money better. Now, I know recently I had on my friend Allison Jones, who talked about money management in the context of her one-on-one -on -one program and a lot of the money thoughts that block us. Caitlin and I go into a little bit of that today. However, Caitlin's background is um, really specific in that she has a, a focus, uh, a, well, I should say this, she has a past history, a very established past history of working in corporate finance. And because of her love of yoga as a student and her love of the community that yoga studios foster, she decided, and she'll tell you a little bit more about when it, what went into this decision, but she decided to change her own career path and leverage all of the corporate finance knowledge she had built in working for Fortune 500 companies and convert it into her own business, which serves yoga and Pilates studio, studio owners. She helps passionate yoga and Pilates studio businesses improve their profit and achieve financial security. I'll just tell you right out of the gate, Caitlin Webb on Instagram, I wanna give you her handle because you're definitely gonna wanna connect with her on Instagram and at least follow the posts that she makes as well as maybe even direct message her. Her handle on Instagram is CaitlinWebb.biz. It's spelled K-A-T-E, so Kate, L-Y-N, Caitlin Webb dot biz at IG. So that's her handle. We're going to go into a whole episode uh, right after this intro here where you hear from her and all she can offer. And we go into this whole conversation about what yoga studio owners can do to get better control of their finances. And again, towards the end, we have this sort of um, really cool conversation that applies to teachers. And so I really want you yoga teachers out there who don't own studios to stick with this episode for um, what really is such a cool idea that honestly, 
I actually am interested in doing myself, although I kind of like what I have going. So I, I probably won't pursue it in the short term. However, it's such a cool idea. So I really hope you guys um, stick through it for the whole episode and listen to this. And I don't think that's going to be a big ask because it's just such an amazing episode with really cool um, info on getting a better handle on your finances. So that's today's episode. I just want to quickly remind you, I'm doing those weekly free classes online. Go to my website, take a look at the um, virtual studio page. You'll see the schedule. I hope to see you in class. I also want to let you know that on my events page of my website, I just loaded up today a brand new recorded webinar that goes through some of the concepts in anatomy that yoga teachers always ask me about. It goes into some of those concepts and also presents to you a path that you can take to get so much more confident in your yoga teaching and to really tackle some of those big challenges that so many teachers tell me they have all the time around queuing and sequencing and answering student questions. So if you didn't make last month's free workshop I did, and or maybe you did, but you want to kind of review the info, or maybe you've never come to one of my free events, you can watch a recorded webinar because I just put one up there. I made it over the weekend and it's really short. It's shorter than my live events. So it's only 20 minutes uh, long, but I really packed it with info and it's got a really cool special offer at the end. So you can find that on the events page of barebonesyoga.com. So hope to see you in class. If you have a moment and you're interested in really up-leveling the confidence you bring to your classes, check out that um, that recorded webinar on the events page of my website. And um, one more fun little note, I am loving TikTok and all over the TikTok these days. So if you are on TikTok, um, give me a, a connection there and you'll see every day I'm on TikTok multiple times a day posting short anatomy lessons, little um, just tips for teachers. Also, of course, I continue with um, video posting every day on Instagram. So I'm really loving those two platforms. And I'd highly encourage you as a yoga teacher to really get on these platforms and make videos and get yourself out there, get yourself sharing content, get yourself building connections with people. It's, um, it's free and, and there's really no reason not to do it, not to take advantage of it. So with that, we're going to go on to my conversation with Caitlin Webb. I hope you love it as much as I did and can't wait to hear your feedback. So feel free to send me a direct message on Instagram and let me know what you think of it. So let's roll with that episode with Caitlin Webb. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. So we're going to just dive right in. I don't know if you saw my message before. I know sometimes when I get together for um, for chats on the podcast, sometimes we have a little chit chat in the beginning. And I really like to just kind of dive right in so that it's really just kind of like a regular conversation between the two of us. So just so you know, this part is going live too. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I um, typically do an intro, so I'll do a little intro separate from this. That'll give people a little bit of your background. And I love to start this way too, because it gives you a chance to tell the listener a little bit about yourself so that they can kind of get an idea before we sort of get into some of the details, um, a little bit about who you are. So I'll start out um, by just welcoming you, of course, to the show and saying that I can't believe I didn't think of this before. <laughs> I kind of thought of it the other day or yesterday when I sent you that note. Um, I'm super excited for this because I, I have such a, a personal affinity for money management as a skill that is just so important for people to have. And yet um, I don't really talk about it as much, you know, with my focus on anatomy, it's not a topic that I talk about. Although I do have um, a whole bunch of business tips and strategies that I offer to teachers. I think in today's show, since finance and money management and developing money strategies and profit planning is your expertise, it really gives me a chance to share with the listeners something that is really important that as yoga teachers, they have a handle on and also yoga studio owners, which I know is an area where you really get out there and support people who own studios. Cause of course 
the um, the financial uh, investment can be pretty significant when you're actually owning a, a brick and mortar space. So I am really glad you're here. And with that, I would love to just have you start out by just sharing anything you want that kind of would give the listener um, a sense of who you are and where you are and what you do. Awesome. And thank you so much for having me, Karen. And I, I totally agree. Um, since you are a successful yoga business owner, there are many people who are starting or struggling during this period. So it certainly helps to have a peer in the, that has a successful business who's making uh, the amount of money that you want to talk about those tips. So critical. And I'll be sharing this as well with people that I talk to um, because I think it is so important. Um, but I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Caitlin. So I come from over a decade of elite corporate finance experience. What that means is that I actually worked in Shanghai at a joint venture. I worked in one of the most prestigious corporate financial management programs in the world where they only take 30 people. I worked at a large tech company whose name every single person knows. And I was doing analysis in cash flow for supply chain, I had my own business unit. I had a dream job, but the issue was my health started to deteriorate. This is years after I used to be a dancer and I used to use yoga as an outlet, but then I stopped because work overcame my life and I realized I needed to make a change. If I continued with my dream job, even though it was six figures, my life was going to continue like this, but I needed, I needed to shift my life away from that. So I decided to pursue my passion. And I love yoga businesses. They have a place in my heart where when I would travel for business, I'd seek out community with, they were so special to me, so important to me, and they changed my life, really. So I knew that I wanted to work specifically with yoga businesses. So I said, how do I combine my passion? Profit planning for large corporations and working with yoga businesses. And it turns out that there is a combination. So I help yoga businesses with profit planning and my passion is to bring the tools and the resources that these large corporations have to you, to the studio owners, to the business owners. And I love talking the business tips and I love your program, Karen, because it the fundamentals of it really do, not only do they help studio owners, but it also helps with the way, a healthy way to view money for our business, which is what do we outsource out? And then also when we price our services, we make sure that we keep the same profit, whether or not we're hiring someone and outsourcing it or not. So really, if we have a healthy view of money, there's no reason why not to outsource critical functions of our business. So in a nutshell, that's who I am. And thank but, you for so much for having me. Of course, of course. So one of the things you said in your intro, I want to just have you sort of explain a little further. You use the term profit planning. So for someone who's listening and is thinking, I'm barely, you know, maybe I'm just teaching on the side or maybe I have a yoga studio and it's barely making ends meet making a profit is sort of the last thing on my mind. So tell us what profit planning is. Is it separate from budgeting and some of the more kind of drier and sort of mundane type activities, or is it all part of the same thing? Uh, very good question. And that's actually what a lot of people get caught up on they'll hire, let's just say a tax accountant because they'll know that they need to do their taxes. And then they'll go to the tax accountant for money advice for the future. They'll say, I want to make $150,000 profit in the future. And they'll ask their tax accountant, but the tax accountant doesn't actually help with projecting into the future. And in fact, I've heard some really detrimental advice given from these tax accountants because they don't look they weren't trained to look at it that way they're very good at taxes for example if someone's going to ask me about filing taxes i'm going to say go to your tax accountant <laughs> they're going right. to know how to do that but when it comes to setting a goal i want to make i want to be and this is a big thing with with yoga businesses they're sharing their passion with the world but then sometimes they overlook the rewards for themselves they deserve to be rewarded for the blessings that they're bringing to others. They deserve to be rewarded for the work that they're putting out there for their community and the benefits that they're getting. And what is a great way to be rewarded? To have financial security, 
to have a, just an ability to spend the money that you're making. And so when we overlook planning for the future, when we only rely on our tax account and then when our money gets all jumbled together, um, that actually takes away the reward that, that they deserve. And so what I actually help with, and in a corporation, it's very clear, like there's very clear lines. There's a tax division, then there's a CPA division, which actually files the financial statements. But then okay, so that was actually one question I had. So a tax accountant is typically different from a CPA. Yes, they have different specialties, basically. It's like you have your general doctor, but then you have a heart surgeon. So different, you go to different people for different things. They're all in medical. <laughs> They're right. different things. <laughs> So you've got your tax accountant who just does taxes and they actually look at it even differently than um, a CPA. And here's the fundamentals behind that. So a long time ago, people were just basically doing their own accounting for profitability and they would list their shares publicly. But then what people realize is if I invest in this company, they say they're making this much profit. But if I invest in this company and they have the same business model, they have a different profit. It's because they were doing accounting differently for their profit. So mm -hmm. tax accountants rely on the tax code. CPAs generally, if they're not a tax CPA, look at the generally accepted accounting principles to come up with profit. And then you have the CFO, who is the same division that I'm in, who says, Basically, the stock price is driven on how much money you expect to make in the future, not how much you're making today. Um, today will impact the estimates for the future. So then you have the division of how do we project this out and understand how much we're going to make in the future. So if when I do profit planning, we get together and we say, okay, how much do you want to make in the future? Do you want to be stuck at $35,000? Are you comfortable with that? And if you are, that's fine. But if you want to make $150,000, we set up a plan to get there. And that includes strategy. Okay, so let me just stop you there because I feel like if people are listening and maybe getting a little overwhelmed with some of the nuts and bolts from kind of the corporate structure, I, I love how you just sort of pivoted to something that really hits home, I bet, for people because you're saying, tell me what you want to make. So it's almost like you're doing that Stephen Covey from Seven Habits of Effective People beginning with the end in mind. You're like saying to the studio owner, right? So now we're talking about your conversation with a client who is a studio owner. And you're saying, okay, here you own this studio. How much money do you want to be able to take back from the earnings of your studio as your salary or however you want to term it. So I guess in a way, now I'm even getting further into the details, is, is, is the profit inclusive of the person's salary? But we can talk about that in a second. I think though, the point I'm trying to make is when you sit down and do profit planning with people, it sounds like that question of tell me what you want to make is an important first step that really speaks to the studio owner's needs and wants and desires from a profit planning perspective. Is that right? That's exactly right. And we even break it up further because we start with how much do you want to make slash be rewarded with this year? We start there this year. What do you want to make at the end of this year? And unfortunately, many people don't have what they're expecting to make at the end of this year. So we start there, we say, at the end of this year, what do you wanna make? And then we go, after we set that plan and we, and we do it based on projection. So it's like, this is an attainable plan. Um, and if it isn't attainable, then we talk through that. But then what we do is after we have our one-year plan, we say, now, what do you wanna make in five years? And that's where we have that five-year profit plan of we get you to those numbers. And this is what they do in corporate, by the way. They say, what do you wanna make? <laughs> right. And you know, I, I'm just sort of blown away by this. And I really want to be sure that anyone listening to this, who is a yoga studio owner, although a lot of the principles that you lay out can be used as by independent teachers too. But the point is, I would bet, 
And I don't know, as you're listening, if this is off base, just let me know. You can send me a DM on Instagram. I would bet that most studio owners never ask themselves that question because they're so used to that sort of being in the grind and nose to the grindstone and being beholden to whoever comes into their studio. I mean, even pre-COVID studios that had a decent flow of students and programs running, I really can't see a lot of studio owners saying, how much money do I want to make, which is such a critical question and one that can really empower you to leverage your business to create the kind of life you want. Now, of course, you got to work backwards from that number, as you said, to come up with the activities that will hit those numbers. Although it sounds like what you're saying is you also work with people on that score and to adjust things as they need to be adjusted. Agreed, but I'm very careful too, and I have a comment on what you're saying on asking ourselves what to make, but I'm very careful to make sure that I recommend the best experts. So we make the plan, we identify the weaknesses, but it's critical that we do go to the correct experts in whatever area it is and get that funding, get that education or get that extra thing. And that's what they do at corporate, right? They, so what kind of like what kind of expertise are are you thinking of? Well, it it ranges, right? If someone is having issues with like they're not getting people in the door, they just aren't doing it. We're going to talk about the strategy because I've invested hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars in education. So I I know the strategy as well. But we're going to get them hooked up. I actually encourage them I say, here are a couple people to follow follow them and see if you're comfortable either taking their free advice or investing in them. And I think that investing in the right people actually gives us a healthy money um, standpoint because we're like, if I invest with this person, I'm expecting to make this much money back. So it's not like I'm investing and I'm losing the money. Okay. So you're saying if, if in your work with someone, you kind of analyze the books And let's say you came up with a plan with the studio owner and six months into the plan, when you went in and reviewed with them how things were going, they weren't seeing the foot traffic they thought, or maybe God forbid, there's another surge of COVID and it's had them pull back on whatever, whatever it is, they they aren't hitting their projections. You're saying at that point to sort of revamp the plan, they might need to connect with someone who is doing what they want to do and maybe has either a program, a marketing program, something that can help them tackle the problem of how do I get more people in my studio? Very correct. And to your point, let's just say someone's investing $500 a month in a social media manager who's just posting online. So they're growing their following, but they aren't converting customers. So they have all these followers and no one's buying. So we're going to say, okay, this 450, if we really need it to convert customers right now, what's a different strategy? Right. Do we invest in advertising? Do we invest in in a Facebook course? You know a Facebook course, right, Karen? So I would, I'd ask my friend, Karen, like, what's that Facebook course you used? Can we help my friend out? (laughs) Yeah, got it. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think this is. I don't know. I I really hope that as people are listening to this, (laughs) this is hitting home for them because I just feel like this is the kind of thing that, I mean, I've never owned a studio yet. I can imagine as a teacher being an independent studio owner and feeling so alone and so, um, so much like I have no resource to turn to about pretty much the most important thing that I can be focusing on, which is the financial health of my business. So these kinds of conversations around how do I bring in more people? How do I allocate money? I'm already allocating to something else where I'm not seeing the kind of return on investment that I want to. How can I reallocate that money? I love that. So, all right. So let's talk about something that I think will be sort of 
um, on top of mind for people, which is the whole impact, and we can take this a bunch of different directions, the whole impact of COVID on their business. Mm -hmm. So we're talking yoga businesses and we're talking about, a, actually tomorrow will be two years since I taught my last in-person class. So I can say as a yoga teacher of many, many years, it's been two years for me without teaching any in-person yoga. When I think about the studios, it's been two years of a lot of changing regulations that have resulted in a lot of changing numbers for them in terms of numbers of people in the studio for class, numbers of people online taking class, how many teacher trainings they're offering, how many people are enrolling in their trainings. Maybe their rent has gone up or down. I know here in Boston right now, because COVID is sort of the numbers are way down, a lot of rents are going back up when before they were pressed down because demand was down. So I don't know, pick a topic under the umbrella of, of you know, how to manage a yoga business during this time. Any of those things, you know, I know we've talked about rent, we've talked about cash flow. So what do you think? What comes to mind that we could talk through a little more? I love what you're bringing up because one of the underlying principles of finance and profit planning is being rewarded for the risks that we're taking and also hedging our risks. So if we have a significant amount of rich risk in an area, we want to do the opposite at the same time to hedge the risk. So when we have an on, a studio that's in person, and right now I actually see so much tremendous value because people are seeking community. They have been isolated. The world like has so many things where the news is just scaring people. So community is critical. But how do we hedge the risks that you just talked about where it could get shut down? It was shut down five or six times in the last two years. How do we hedge that risk and keep the community? Um, so a big part of that is what, it, what kind of slow, tangible steps can we make? A lot of these businesses did do some stuff online, right? So having that online piece hedges the risk of losing all of our income in person. But this actually gives us a lot of opportunity. And this is why I actually really, I have my Facebook group because I, and I do want people this to grow to something where I do have people like you, Karen, coming on and talking about best practices or even people just really relying on each other. Because if we have an in-person studio, how do we also make that community feel online? What we can do, here's an option, is we have our memberships, but we include that to be our online group as well. So they also include the Zooms and like a Facebook community that they pay for. So this is paid members community. And you just try to also foster that so that if people are not able to come to the class, they still get the community and the lessons online. I mm -hmm. think a big opportunity in the future is gonna be membership, hybrid memberships, where you can either come in person or online. And the critical piece though, won't be just doing the classes because a lot of businesses right now are just showing class, 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 like health, health, health. People go to yoga for community. It's huge. And it, that's what I went to. If I see community, I'm like, I want to go. I'll pay the $150 membership a month to have that community. And to have the option to go in person is great. But also if there's like a paid Facebook group, if there's online classes, if there's even like just get togethers, that would be huge. I'd love to see that. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I just read an article before hopping on this call. Um, I try to limit how many times I check uh, Boston.com and CNN.com. And I did it right before I got on this call. And um, you're so right about the news being so scary. As soon as I looked, I was like, oh my God, this is so sad. And so just everything is so scary internationally. On the local website though of Boston.com, which is essentially the old Boston Globe paper, they had an article about people returning to work or being asked to return to the office and how so many of them are just feeling like if my employer doesn't offer a hybrid opportunity, I don't really think I can do it because going back means I'm spending money on 
breakfast and lunch out. I'm paying for childcare more. My commute is going to stress me out and all that stuff. So what you're talking about reminds me of that. It's basically saying to the yoga studios, yes, you got forced to do hybrid with no warning when everything shut down two years ago. And now you can create a hybrid opportunity for your community that sort of hedges your financial risk. Is that kind of what you're envisioning as being a new model of, of providing services as a studio? Exactly. And I also want to bring in, so again, I'm going to talk money because that's what my, what I've been trained to think about, right? So let's say that we do identify a hybrid model where we do a membership. Let's just say it's $150 a person in a membership, right? Well, then we want to price in there. We, we talk about how much money we want to take out of it, profit for the business owner, but it's not healthy to say, I'm going to take every single cent. We say, I'm going to take a certain amount of money and then pay others who can help me with this plan to do the work. So there's an opportunity to even pay yoga instructors to foster that community for you or like to really involve your yoga instructors to um, maybe even bring people in yeah. to be hosting. So it's really almost like there's, there's a huge opportunity to shift the business model where you do have your yoga instructors, but you leverage them as well for this online community or for these online memberships. Again, we're yeah. Hosting, yep. Yeah, the thing that's coming to my mind as well in the model you're describing is when you have a per person monthly fee as a studio, that takes you out of your dependence on people that just come for a handful of classes. In other words, the foot traffic model, which is seemingly how many studios started. They would just charge for classes. And of course, over the years, you could buy a class pack or they would do Groupon or other things like that. It sounds like in this model, you would have some insulation from like seasonal things that affect foot traffic. Like in the summer here in Boston, I think generally speaking, there aren't as many people that go into the studio because they're traveling, going on vacation, things like that. If you had though a model where you were charging 150 bucks a head per month and offering other things that weren't tied to just the yoga class and the person taking the yoga class, now you're creating a constant revenue stream for yourself. So you're insulated from some of the things that affect foot traffic numbers. Exactly. That's absolutely critical is really trying to think through that. I do want to say too, I really am happy with that. I chose my specialty, which is yoga and Pilates teachers, because I also know from working with other people that that sales in July, although foot traffic might go down, the online traffic actually is higher than the rest of the months. Right. That's something to think about. Like maybe when people are traveling, they'll log on for a second to just have community when their kids are screaming in the background, right. going to the pool, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's certainly the portability of it makes it um, an option for people. Whereas obviously before COVID, if they couldn't physically walk into the studio, that was pretty much it. I, I really don't think, at least here in the Boston area, I don't think many studios really had online classes until, you know, until we had to offer, until they had to offer them. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, rent comes to my mind because it's, I don't, again, I have not ever owned a studio, although I know a lot of people who do. And I envision that rent from a line item perspective is probably the biggest number on their budget. Would you say? About 30%. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, there are a bunch of different things that come to my mind. Someone who's listening who might be behind on their rent because their revenue isn't what it is. Someone who is experiencing a landlord who's starting to say, we're probably going to be increasing your rent because it's been depressed for so, so long because of COVID. Are any of these things, things where you have some ideas or thoughts in mind? I, I bet there must be. <laughs> you hit 
hit on a hot topic actually yeah. i'm like getting all excited over here like i know i'm i i don't know that these are softball questions but i sort of feel like you probably get a lot of questions about these things so it's great i'm glad that you have a lot of thoughts because again geez, if I had a studio and I had no one like you to talk to, I honestly don't know how I would do it. I don't know. I would just, I mean, I have some background in finance, but it's just from life experience, not from professional. So, all right. So go ahead. Well, so step one, and I'm just, I'm begging you, if you're listening to please just try and do this yourself is try to at least do a year perspective of you have your total revenue, you have your rent. What does your rent divided by your revenue, what does that percent look like? That's the first thing we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at your rent divided by your percent, by your revenue, and we're gonna look at it to the year and we're gonna look at any hikes or spikes, okay? Then we're gonna look at it for five years and, and we're gonna listen to what your landlord's saying about changing it. And then we're going to negotiate because if your landlord, if you especially if you've done a fit out, if you've invested all this money into a space that's specific for a yoga studio and you have projections where you're like i can't literally afford this it will cost the landlord i mean if they're at least a savvy landlord they'll realize that this space is a yoga slash dance space and if you can show them look here's the projections i literally can't keep doing this or this isn't compensating me enough i'm gonna have to figure something else out that's one negotiating standpoint, but I do want to be super um, clear about this. We can negotiate rent and it's critical to make sure that that if they're putting stuff in the contract that says things like even if there's COVID, you have to pay your rent, don't sign it. Do not sign it, whatever you do and and talk to them and say this isn't OK. This is not fair. And they'll say things like this is standard. You say, no, it's not standard for me or you cross it out, you do whatever you can, but you do not sign that. And it's, and it's your prerogative. You are, you're allowed not to sign it. And honestly, they're smarter to sign something that you're comfortable with, because if you do, God forbid, need to leave, then they can get someone else in faster instead of dealing with all of these, these legal fees and all that stuff. So, you know, sometimes we have landlords though, that aren't willing to think about logic that's unfortunate. But then that also gives us an idea of we don't, maybe it is worth it to find a landlord that, that works with us. Right. Okay. So those are some options there. All right. So in terms of, I mean, I sort of feel like there's one big issue. I mean, rent is obviously a big issue when you look at the allocation of the dollars you're making. I think something that stood out to me just in your explanation there of looking at your rent as a percentage of your revenue, I think that brings up kind of the issue that's at the forefront, which is how much control or how do I as a yoga studio owner get a handle on or control better or be able to predict better my revenue on a monthly basis? when I'm running a business that generates revenue when people you know, come to class or sign up for my membership, let's just, or you know, let's call it that. So you mentioned earlier Facebook ads. So that's obviously one way as a studio owner to generate interest and potential foot traffic. I don't want to necessarily go into a whole conversation about Facebook ads. I guess what I'm saying is, is part of profit planning working with the studio owner to generate more, come up with techniques to generate more interest in their business so that they get more people in the door? Or is it more that's really on them to figure that out? You're there to sort of help them with the planning just with the numbers that they have and that's a very good question and i'm gonna i'm gonna shift this a little bit though to talk about that a lot of the reasons why studio owners maybe don't invest appropriately in the resources they need is because they don't have a healthy money mindset and so one of the things that we talk about through profit planning is we say 
Okay, let's just say that you make $100,000 of revenue, but you have $80,000 of expenses and you only get $20,000 of profit. What about if we have $100,000 of revenue and we only have $50,000 of expenses and we get $50,000 of profit? So one of the things, this is an, here is a common unhealthy mindset that we do tackle with profit planning that actually helps with what you're talking about, which is pivoting, investing in the resources that we need, really identifying our goal and finding a way to get there is a lot of people are will say i made this much money i'm going to hold on to all of it i don't want to spend a cent i want to be the only person in charge i want to be the only person doing everything that will actually result many times in less profit less money at the end of the day that person will generally make less money because they aren't getting the quality resources that will give them more money. So in investments, for example, when we invest in our retirement account, we're not thinking of that as an expense. We're not saying I'm paying $350 a month. This is going to go away. We think I'm paying $350 a month to get 350 plus an interest rate. So a healthy money mindset, like you said, is you, we have to identify where our weaknesses are. And we say, I want to invest $500 and get $550 back. And we actually even compare that return with other things. So it's critical to identify our strategy and profit planning. We talk about it. We do talk about the best people to go through, go to for solving that problem and also how to get the money back. And I'm actually going to bring up your program here, right? Let's say teacher training is a big source of revenue but it's also a significant amount of our time. So when- Well, an expense because they're paying oftentimes teachers to handle certain aspects of the program. Exactly. Aspects, yeah. Right, but here, here's where I wanna bring up the expense part, right? Let's just say that we can't have the teacher program because we aren't hiring the right people, then the technically the income that we get is zero, right? If we can't pay the expenses to have the teacher program, we can't have the teacher program, so we get zero revenue. Right. But if we invest in our teachers, we get the revenue, we pay our expenses, we get X amount of profit, right? Now, what's critical, like what with what your program does, is let's just say a yoga studio owner has a teacher training, they pay their teachers, but they want to add this level of anatomy support so that their teachers actually pass the exam they actually get the certification and it's a worthwhile investment for the teachers well they're probably going to pay more especially if they have issues with anatomy like if that's a risk that they won't pass anatomy it makes sense for them to pay more so a healthy money mindset is i'm going to get i'm going to get this much total revenue for the teacher training and i want this much profit and i'm willing to pay this amount of expenses to get there, including an anatomy training program to make sure right. they pass. Right, got it. Yeah, um, I think it's it's interesting. And I think Facebook ads is a great example of something you can invest in and then track to see, is the money I'm investing in this uh, process resulting in more people coming. Obviously, if the ad's not doing well, you're not going to keep feeding it. However, if it is doing well, it's an expense that's directly resulting in greater foot traffic. So there it's a justifiable expense as long, I guess to a certain extent, as long as you have the money to pay for it. So it's not like you're going to go into debt to Facebook to buy your ads is that yeah you that absolutely one. we don't want to go into debt doing anything that's why okay. we talk about reallocation of funds and like you said monitoring it am i getting the results that i want or do i have to take a step back and shift my strategy let me ask you one question about debt um what is there something um like i know obviously well the listeners won't know but you and i are in the same entrepreneurial group with james wedmore and i know sometimes james talks about good business debt and so i guess part of what i'm thinking is would if you had a credit card with fairly decent interest 
would it be a reasonable financial decision to, for instance, put your Facebook ad costs on that low interest rate credit card can, and consider that good business debt to have because it potentially, and obviously you're monitoring the ads, but you're potentially driving new leads into your business, even though this credit card is starting to accrue debt, is that considered good debt? And that's where it gets complicated and we want to monitor it, but I do want to actually elaborate on that on what to use debt for because many people do get small business loans to fund their studios. Let me give you an example, though, of where we didn't get a profit planner and so we went into bad debt. <laughs> so let's just say theoretically, and this is kind of based on an example that I know, um, let's just say that there's a studio owner who gets $200,000 loan and puts it all towards making this beautiful studio. Well, from a finance perspective, if they had a finance person, what that person would assume is, okay, if you invest $200,000, you wanna make back $200,000 more because you're assuming having this beautiful studio is gonna bring people in. Well, this is why it's also important to have a profit planner who has their own business and who's been through it because if I saw someone get a $200,000 loan and they were putting everything towards revamping the studio, I would say, well, where's the location? This particular location, let's just say, is where there's no foot tra traffic. It's in an office park. No one can see where it is. No one knows where it is. Then the first thing I'm going to say is you're not going to get the customers to cover that expense. Bottom line, you won't. You're going to get the same people. Maybe they're going to want to keep coming, but unless you take a significant amount, at least 20%, at least 20% of that 200,000. So that would be $40,000 and you get an ad manager and you invest in advertising, you're not going to get it. Ads is critical. Mm -hmm. It is good debt, but we don't want to necessarily, like if we're doing ads, like you said, and we're not getting any of <laughs> traffic, then it's worth it to invest in an ads manager. It's worth it to invest in a course. It's worth it in to strategize and do what you want. Because actually a lot of people do throw money at ads and get nothing back. They might trickle in some stuff, but that's actually a strategy corporations use because they're like, well, we have trillions of dollars. We can just throw money at ads. It doesn't really matter if they're the best ads, but we can throw money at it and we'll get some, some revenue back. Right, maybe. right, right. And I can certainly say from running Facebook ads for my own business, it's pretty complicated. It's taken me, um, you know, not only the course I invested in, but, um, but quite a bit of time to figure it out. I'm wondering, you know, before Facebook was a platform to advertise, yoga studios depended primarily on word of mouth as a way to get foot traffic. Um, I can remember, again, before Groupon, it was very common to have a refer a friend bonus where you would reward an existing member for bringing a friend. Um, I also remember the days of going into a coffee shop and there'd be things on the wall about yoga studios, you know? So are there other, when you work with yoga studios, are there other things that they're doing besides paid advertising to get students? I love that you brought that up because that is actually a critical thing. And this again comes back to a healthy money mindset. We hope to spend money to get money back. And a detrimental act, um, mindset is I'm not going to spend any money. I'm going to keep it all. I'm going to take it, right? <laughs> and so when we say, I want to get new customers, and let's just say the, we're trying to get a $150 membership, a healthy finance money mindset is if I pay anything under $149, to get that customer in, I'm technically making more money. Or actually you would basically say like, if it, if it takes any cost of sales, you would do the minimal amount. So let's just say it's $120, okay? So if I pay anything, $100, $20 and less to get that customer in my door, it's worth it. And we're not even considering the lifespan of getting that customer in the door. So having incentive programs, and people don't even require a lot. You can do fun things like bring your friends in, we'll give you a gift card, we'll buy you a nice wine, we want to reward you for taking the time out of your day 
to refer my business, like respecting other people's times for sharing, you know, just mm -hmm. the word about your business, helping money mindset. Absolutely. Invest in our current clients to bring in more, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Yeah. And I think that that also gives the studio more control over the initiative to really track how it's going versus when you, for instance, place a Facebook ad, um, you don't always feel like you have as much control over that. There is an art to it, but um, so one of the things that keeps coming up and you keep mentioning this is healthy money mindset. <laughs> and so I sort of feel like we should talk about what does that look like? You know, cause it's interesting. We can talk about that and like completely be in sort of the woo woo space. However, we're talking about it now as part of what some people might consider like, oh, I don't really find, you know, financial management discussions to be woo woo. They're usually pretty black and white and numbers driven. However, you keep bringing up this kind of you know, ethereal, spiritual mindset, neuroscience-based kind of topic. So let's talk about that a little bit. What, what's the role of money mindset with this whole conversation we're having? I love that you bring that up because I think that I've heard people talk on the mindset, the woo-woo mindset, and there's some truth to it, but we can also apply just logic to that and get the same result like it's in the same space of a yeah. holy money mindset yeah uh, one thing so like I'll, I'll start actually at something that you said earlier which is that a women woman business owner for example may not feel comfortable bringing up finances talking about it they might have an idea in their head but they're not sharing it with their significant other they're not sharing it with anyone because it's almost like they don't feel right talking about it healthy money mindset is that if you're a business owner, we can talk about money. <laughs> like, let's yeah, start. And honestly, that's like <laughs> a big first step for some people. I mean, I can imagine, you know, just you're owning a local studio on main street in your town and you go home to your husband or, or a partner, whatever uh, your scenario is. And, um, and you're ashamed to bring up troubles you're having, or you're scared to bring them up or, or you're overwhelmed and, and don't know where to begin. So I can totally imagine that. I, I had somebody on the show recently who does money management as part of a spiritual program. And she talked about a client she had who hadn't opened her mail for like two years. And when she, because she just was in the denial mode about money, none of her mail. And when she opened her mail, she found out that her father had left her over a hundred thousand dollars, but because she hadn't opened her mail, she didn't know it until she enrolled in Allison's program and Allison got her on a track to sort of face her fears around money. So that was a direct manifestation that just played itself out. Like you're saying in sort of the logic of having a money management plan. So, okay. So I, I sort of jumped in there. I apologize. So you were saying this whole idea of, um, of not being afraid to kind of talk about money. I love that you brought that up though, because, um, it's, it's actually so common. And I do want to touch a little bit, um, on something about kind of how the world teaches women not to talk about money. So I was a professional in money management. <clears throat> There's a lot of sexism there. So what I've learned is I've had to break my own barriers of like, wait a second, I can talk about this as a female, because even like, even if you don't have that professional experience and you're just in your own house and you have a husband, there still is a lot of culture that goes around with, uh, you know, we shouldn't be managing the money or we shouldn't be talking about the money or what the man tells us about the money is correct. Bottom line, we can't question it. Like there's so many layers to yeah. this uh, thing. And it does come to, in my opinion, a lot of it has to do with just as a female, not being given the like not being allowed in many areas to talk of or bring up money. And so one of the big pieces is we're allowed to do it. Right. We're allowed okay. to talk about it. And 
but telling ourselves that that's kind of the woo space. Like, wait a second, I'm allowed to talk about this. I've told myself that before, like I'm allowed to do this. But then when we're allowed to talk about it, um, there's two different perspectives that kind of come up. One is we're going to spend money without looking at it. So we're going to invest in the social media manager. We're not going to see the returns of it. We're going to invest in all of these things and we're not going to track that we're getting the money back kind of a perspective. We're just going to invest, throw the money out there and not look at that space. The other piece is we're not going to invest. <laughs> we're going to try and get everything. Um, we're, we're, we have a very limited mindset, a very limited scope of I only see what's in front of me. I'm not going to see this bigger picture, that kind of stuff. So you're saying those are two approaches because I sort of see another one, which is where I think you're headed. Those are the two unhealthy money pro projects. Got it. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm like, we're not, we are not saying you should be in either of those buckets. Although I totally agree. Matter of fact, in the entrepreneurial group that you and I are both a part of, I see plenty of people that write in and they say, I don't have time to do Facebook ads. I just want to hire a Facebook manager and hand it all over to them. And those are the people that I usually comment to their posts. And I say, look, you have to know Facebook ads to hire a Facebook ads manager. Otherwise, how can you assess the results they tell you, which is a direct result of the money they're spending on your behalf? It's kind of like turn a blind eye is not, you're not hiring an expert so you can abdicate everything to them. No. You're absolutely right. And that's a very rare money mindset. I love that you bring this up because again, we're allowed to talk about this. We're allowed to be aware, you know? Yeah. And I mean, Facebook ads is a perfect example of that because it is complicated and that's where people tend to hit a wall and they throw up their hands in frustration and they go, I'm just going to hire somebody who's an expert in this. Well, that's great. It doesn't get you off the hook because it's your money. And so it sounds like what you're saying is scenario one is outsource everything, have a quote unquote healthy money, manage healthy money mindset and just give it all away to experts and not monitor how they're spending your money. And the other scenario, which is also unhealthy is not to give anything away and to just be tunnel vision doing everything on your own. So what's the middle of the road, middle ground? Exactly. And where that starts, and this is where even like the woo-woo mindset, I think that what happens with the woo-woo mindset, I'm bringing this up because they actually touch on very basic principles of planning, which are critical. Like if you think of a vision board, I personally don't do a vision board, but it's, it's the first step of planning. You put a plan together, right? Of course. No, it's very true. And I've talked about, you know, James talks a lot about Catherine Zankina. She's manifestation babe on Instagram. And I remember in an early episode that I've talked about on the podcast here before, when she talked about some early results she started to see in her business, even though she had read The Secret, she knew that that wasn't enough. She knew that that was part of the mindset coming from sort of the spiritual thoughts, but you needed to have a plan. You couldn't just sit on your couch and say, I want a Ferrari, I want a Ferrari. You needed to come up with a plan to get the Ferrari. Otherwise, you can sit there and dream about it all you want. It's never going to happen. So the same thing here, you can dream about having a successful studio, but the devil is in the details. Uh, exactly. It's, it's when we have a plan, and here's where it's freeing to have a plan, right? Because both of those mindsets of the don't look at the results, just invest, or don't invest, just take all the money. Neither of them say, okay, well, how much money do I want to walk away with? Because right. if you think about, I want to walk away with $30,000, then the expenses don't matter, really. I mean, like they do to the point where yeah. you want to invest the right amount to get the 30000 or sure. you want to, you know what I mean? So if we set that plan 30000 then we price, right, to get to that 30000 And that's freeing, right? Because that's the healthy money mindset. You say, I, I put a target down. Here are the steps to do it. And we monitor our success, we shift if we have to, but also we invest because there's a lot of people who don't invest their money and then it takes years to get to even where someone who invests can start off with. 
Right, right. And I think too, I mean, when you present these two scenarios, it almost sounds like in the scenario of the person who's not reinvesting money they earn into their own business to outsource certain things, it sounds like that person might have a lot of money coming in. I think about kind of a third scenario where the studio owner is barely able to make just their fixed expenses based upon the revenue that they're bringing in. So that person who's listening to this and they're like, geez, I would certainly gladly hire a Facebook ads manager or invest in a course to help me learn how to market my business better. But I can't even barely make, you know, the towel service, the rent, the water, whatever the other electricity, heat, whatever the other expenses are. So what, what's that person's best next step or first step? And that's, that's critical that you brought it up. And that has to do with, I like, I've termed the coin like microfinancing for these types of things. We got to identify if we're struggling, if we continue on this space, we're not going to shift. We're not going to make any shifts. We're not going to make more money. We're going to continue in this exact same line of thought. So here are some microfinancing options. Like if you have customers, leverage them, which is what you brought up, really make it an incentive. Say if you bring someone in and you get, let's just say $15 a class, say I'll give you $10 in a gift card because that's $5. Slowly make up that money and we want to microfinance as best we can. We want to shift and take the small dollars that we have and invest it in the critical resources that we need. But it does have to do with like, we, we have this plan, we're looking at where we're going and we're, we, let's just say we've been doing this for a year. We're not seeing any change. We're barely making our expenses. We have to shift something. Right, right. Yeah, and it reminds me actually of, you know, even on a personal level, when COVID shut down the studios two years ago, you know, literally I went to bed on Sunday night, two years ago tomorrow, and I woke up in the morning to a bunch of emails that I couldn't go into the studio and teach anymore because they were all shut down. So for me personally, that was like 30 to 40% of my revenue because I had my online program. However, teaching in person, I wasn't just teaching in studios, I was teaching children in preschools and all of that shut down and those were private contracts. So my per class reimbursement for teaching children was like triple what I was making teaching adults in studios because I personally negotiated those contracts and those were specialty contracts to teach kids. So I immediately had to go to my budget and start to ax things from my budget. So I even went to like Netflix. I just tried to cut, I called my credit cards and see if I can negotiate down my interest rate. I talked to my landlord and immediately said, I just woke up this morning and found out 40% of my revenue is now not coming in, <laughs> you know? Um, so when you meet with a studio owner who's in that predicament where they have a period of time where they're barely or not even making expenses. Is that an exercise that they do, that you do with them to just look at their line items and start to see what they can take out, eliminate? Absolutely, You're absolutely right. And I love that you brought it up because if that's the case, if we're, if, if we're in that space, then it's more critical than ever to be looking at our money and our resources and reallocating them. And what you did, Karen, was phenomenal. And that just is, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of respect for your money, right? Like when we do things like that, it means that we respect the amount of time and effort we went into, into getting that money. It's, it's about, it's just a, it's a wonderful thing, you know? Well, I will, I will say shout out to Mel Abraham because <laughs> at the very beginning of the shutdown, he came on the podcast, my podcast, I had him come on and he gave the listeners and myself, of course, 
a whole bunch of suggestions. And I had sought him out. For those of you listening who haven't heard that episode, it's two years ago I interviewed. You can follow him on Instagram, Mel Abraham. It's Mel A. Abraham. And he's a financial planner. And like Caitlin has a long background in finance. And he had made a bunch of those suggestions. So I just literally off of that episode started working down the list. So it sounds like that's part of what you're saying too, is that, you know, having a good money mindset is being able to sort of objectively look at where you're at rather than shoving it under the rug. And that's where, and I, by the way, I love Mel Abraham. I follow him. He does wealth advisory, which That's means right. he takes your money and he helps you personally advise it. I do corporate finance. So that's the business planning specifically. Uh, I, it kind of, but I love, I love his, his resources. I follow him. I, I don't think he's ever met me. So he's going to be like, <laughs> this girl, here's this one, this episode. but anyways, Love and he is very good with your personal finances. If you want to do wealth management personally, def, like go to him, ask him, and invest, right? Because it's like yes. you invest a certain amount of money, you expect to get a certain amount of money back. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, so we were talking about if a studio owner is sort of in the dire straits of just barely having enough money to do anything. So not like these scenarios we're talking about. I can invest and just abdicate or I can, you know, um, keep all the money myself. Then there's that third scenario of someone who barely is making ends meet. Maybe they have a pile of bills. Maybe their landlord's been calling them saying, you're two months behind on rent. It sounds like step one is sort of what I did, like looking at their budget and maybe just saying like, do I need to cancel the water service and the towel service for three months and tell people, look, we're going to basics. We're here for class. Bring your own towel, bring your own water. We hope to, and there's no shame in that. It's like, look, this is, this is reality sometimes given the situations we're dealing with because of the pandemic. Yes. And it's about evaluating. So let's just say they, they're barely making ends meet. It's about evaluating, okay, what money do I have? Like, and that comes down to writing it down. The most basic task of money management is just writing things down in a list and reviewing them. Like if we can do that, step one, even if you don't invest in, in a program, write things down, like write them in a list, just like you said, ax them off and then add up the amount of money that you're axing off, try to see the differential and really look for a solution. Follow people on Facebook, follow people um, that are experts in their field, really look for a solution. And you know what, you can actually also negotiate with people, right? Like with your anatomy course, I'm sure that there's an opportunity where if a yoga instructor, a yoga <laughs> studio come up to you, and they're like, right now, we don't have that money, you would talk to them about payments. Sure. Of right. course, because for me, I look at it as an investment in a relationship now that I want to nurture to have for the long term. So absolutely. But on that note too, it's like if they aren't making money and they want to negotiate, great. But then later on down the road, a healthy money mindset is we're going to pay the full value. Sure, of course, of course. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, no, totally. So, all right. So now that we've talked a little bit about money management in this last piece, I want to give people an idea of what program you have that kind of pulls all of what we're talking about together in a cohesive, organized way. So what does it feel like when someone hires you to work with them? I love that question because it, it is kind of like, like how, do I, how do I get control of my money if I feel like I don't have any control of it right now? And that's where it's really helpful for my program because I work with people one-on-one -on -one. And at the beginning, for the first month, we actually do two one-on-one -on -one meetings a week. And the purpose of that is I sit down, I bring the materials, I have the spreadsheet, I'm typing things in, and I ask you questions. And so the first, the first month, you show up, you answer the questions, and then by the end of that month, we have a full year plan. So this year, 
what's our plan? And I love what happens in people's eyes when we, when I show, when we get to that part where I show them the plan that they actually created, right? They're telling me things. I'm just typing it in. I'm guiding them the same way in a yoga class, the teacher guides someone and then they're like, wait, my core is better. Like, same thing. But I love when the light bulb goes off and they're like, wait a second, this is actually really helpful. Yeah. I can see my money. <laughs> like, yeah. and I didn't even notice. I'll bet. And I mean, what a relief, even if they're not at the level of revenue generation that they want to be, it must be, you must see clients who just feel relief simply by getting more organized. Well, and that's the thing is we go through and we say, we actually do scenario analysis, which is so critical. We say, here's your one year plan if we don't do anything different. So this is where you will end up at the end of this year if we don't change a thing, which is for many people, it's fine. Um, here's where your money plan is if you hit these numbers and invest in these things, it's usually higher. Here's your money plan if the whole world stops turning and you have to shut right. down again. Right. And we write those things down. But it gives us a perspective like, wait a second, this is where I'll end up with these three scenarios. So that's, it. you know. Got it. And, you know, it's interesting. I was just thinking um, of another idea. And I'm wondering if anyone has ever that you've worked with tried this. I can remember one of the studios I taught for, they did a really good job of bonding with neighboring businesses that were not yoga studios and giving those businesses incentive to offer their customers like the hair salon down the street or even the gym down the street that didn't have yoga classes or you know, the local restaurant. Is that something that you've ever seen kind of like a business collaboration of sorts as a way to drive foot traffic? I love that. I do. And I, it's always important to, to invest with us. Like if I get a $150 men, uh, membership out of it, I can spend $120 on these things. But I do want to say that the world's shifting. And so now that we know that people are relying more online and they're not necessarily going to the coffee shops, they're not going to the hair salons to find that stuff. Like, yes, it's worth it, but we don't want to make that our only strategy. I actually talked to someone the other day who did what, in my opinion, is a little bit of an outdated course. She spent thousands of dollars to learn how to do only what you were explaining. So only find people that way. But you and I have both invested in James Wedmore's BBD, right? Yes. So we also know that times are shifting and to get people online is a completely different World. Yeah, process. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying it has to be sort of multi-pronged, the the approach. Don't spend too much money or time with something that's shifting, right? We want to be yeah. We yeah. want to be in the front end of where the world's going. You Got know? it. Um, I have another question, and this sort of I, I want to try to wrap up here, although this sort of takes us a little back, although I'm really dying to hear what you're going to say about this. So in the model that we've been talking about, we keep throwing out this just kind of imaginary number of $150 per month per person. So let's just kind of say that represents a monthly fee that one person would pay for membership to the studio. And for that, they would, let's just say they would get unlimited classes access to the private Facebook group, maybe once a month, there's a virtual slash online gathering, I don't know, a discount from a local wine, I don't know, whatever, whatever that includes. Would you suggest that studios from a cash flow, from a revenue generation perspective, shift more of their customer acquisition to a monthly model versus the sort of long standing, although I, like I mentioned before, there are class passes and that thing like things like that. Is that more of a of a reasonable way to build revenue versus just having people come in and pay by the class or by five class packs or 10 class packs? Very, very good question. And I want to say this is one of the reasons why 
I do add value to the studio owners themselves because I do work with other studio owners. So I know what people are willing to pay. I would yeah. say if someone didn't even have a studio, they just have an online thing, people are willing to pay a minimum of at least a hundred dollars so a month. That's a month. But it comes down to, and so if we do have a studio, we can, people are will, people, especially now when they're deprived of community, they're deprived of people, they're willing to pay it. But here's the caveat. If we want to set up this program, we have to answer a customer's question. We have to give them what they want. And a lot of studio owners give people what the studio owner wants. <laughs> like They'll think I want this, so I'm going to offer this. But this is the critical difference in terms of pricing is if you have members, sit them down and really try to hear from them. What do you want out of the studio? What kind of, and they might just kind of come up with kind of shallow answers. Try to dig deep. Be like, if I yeah. offered this community, if I offered a PT once a month to talk about lower back pain, if I offered a nutritionist, like, like dig in and mm -hmm. say, what would you pay this much for? But Karen, I have to be honest, if someone even without a studio were to, were to offer just two live classes a week, and I think the paid Facebook group is critical, and possibly other kind of community events, like here's some things to make you feel better, to help you with mental health, all that stuff, many people would be willing to pay yeah. um, $97. And yeah. And the, to, the thing I love about that we're going in this direction is because now that kind of offer is something that if you're listening to this right now and you don't own a studio and you're an independent yoga teacher who doesn't want to own a studio, what you're describing is a virtual yoga studio model that any yoga teacher could build and use their relationships with other people in the wellness space to supplement the classes they're teaching and they could generate per person monthly revenue in a membership format. And I just think that is the coolest idea that allows because of just all of what we've been through and people now leaning more on online as an opportunity for them to consume these kinds of services. Now, as a yoga teacher, I can essentially open a virtual studio. I don't need to pay rent. And I can offer all these cool things that, quite frankly, if I just did it in the in the in real life space and I had a nutritionist come in on a Wednesday night at seven o'clock at night, how many people could make that? But if I do it online, I'll probably even get more people that can attend because they could probably be eating dinner at home while watching her presentation or the, the nutritionist presentation. So I just think that is the coolest idea that I hope inspires some independent teachers to kind of create something like that, where now you could be working with the independent teacher who doesn't have a brick and mortar studio, but who has a monthly membership, i.e. a virtual studio that is generating revenue that can also benefit from your program. You're absolutely right. And I want to say people are, I'm going to use the word just like they're dying for the community. I am one of those people, right? I love the people that I've met through my business, but I would pay a certain amount of money. Yeah to have a community and the health benefits that all yeah. go with it. And even like, let's just say you did get rid of your studio and you did this online model. You could even offer something like if you want the in-person thing, say every month we do a workshop at a brewery. Of course. That's included. And it's yeah. like, yeah, they might not live close enough to do it, but they would feel like they would have that option. And sure. so that would actually make them even more willing to invest. Sure. Okay. All right. So in the last few moments here, can you tell people how they, how do they enroll in your program? How do they take the first step if they're listening and they're interested and they're already starting to maybe count themselves out because they don't have the money? Like, how do we get those people to at least contact you to talk to you about what they heard today and that they're feeling like they're really ready to tackle the financial end of owning a studio. How can we help them? Please email me directly <laughs> at team, T-E-A-M, at 
Samson, S A M as in Mary, P as in Paul, S O N 12.com. So team at Samson12.com. Okay, so that I'm going to put in the show notes. The other thing, though, is you're on Instagram too. So they could DM you on Instagram, right? DM me on Instagram, Facebook. I'm available. What's your, what's your Instagram handle? CaitlinWebb.biz, B I Z. So K A T E L Y N W E B B dot biz. CaitlinWebb.biz at, and then at Instagram, blah, blah, blah. Okay, got it. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And when, for people listening, when I post this episode later today, which is Monday, March 14th, I will link all my posts and my stories about this episode to Caitlin's profile on Instagram. So if you are listening and you heard about this on Instagram, just go back to my Instagram and you'll see her Instagram handle because she'll be highlighted in my story. Um, wow, this was great. I just really feel like, um, there's so much here that people can take advantage of. And I, I just, I really, really hope that people contact you to, to have even just like a sit down initial consult, you know, kind of thing. Um, now in wrapping up, I, I do want to mention, so for those of you listening, Caitlin and I did a workshop last week. And she showed a slide presentation that goes into a lot of what we talked about today in the visual world, because I know everybody's just listening to this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a link to that workshop Caitlin and I did last week, and I'm going to connect it to this podcast episode. So when you're listening to this, everybody, you can go to the show notes page of this episode on my website, and there will be a link to the webinar Caitlin and I did last Thursday. So if you're intrigued and you want to dive further into this, go check that out. It's about a 45 minute presentation. You'll see um, the slide deck that that she goes through, which gives you some examples of some of the spreadsheets that she talked about today. And she reiterates a lot of the concepts we talked about today as well. So we're going to kind of connect the workshop you and I did last week with this conversation. So it's like a whole complete package of free financial guidance for yoga studio owners. And also really at the end, we realized really for yoga teachers who might want to start a virtual studio. I am just so excited about that idea. I think it's just so cool. So thank you so much for being here. This was really fun and really interesting. I learned a lot and I hope people listening did too. So any last words you want to say as we wrap up? Karen, thank you so much for having me on here. And thank you so much for all of your offerings. I've been doing your free uh, classes, which I just love. Again, it's so nice to just feel like you get these communities to like see people on zoom and to be there and uh really appreciate getting to know you these past few weeks and thank you for having me of course of course so sit tight because after we get off of this um within a couple of hours i'm going to send you this it's going to be live on the podcast we have we're, we're in a no delay world over here so my my colleague jackson's going to post this right quick so this will go live tonight and i'll send you the link uh when it does perfect okay thanks so much Bye bye Bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. Before you go, I want to let you know about a new mini course I just created as of October 2021. It's called the Yoga Anatomy Blueprint Learning Program mini course. It's essentially an introductory version to my signature program that teaches you anatomy so that you grow your confidence in sharing cues and sequences and in all those conversations you have with your students. If you're like some of the yoga teachers I speak to, you might feel as if you don't have the time to do my full program. That's one of the main reasons I created this mini course, which will give you all the same steps in my signature blueprint approach to teaching you anatomy and will allow you to complete it in much less time. There are 10 modules each of about 10 minutes each, and the entire program walks you through mini lessons from the larger program. 
You'll leave with specific new skills that you can start to use right away. You may also leave with a keen interest in enrolling in the larger program because your curiosity and confidence have been stoked. For you, the podcast listener, I'm offering $5 off the purchase price of the mini program, which is just priced at $27, so the cost will go down to $22 for you. Once you complete the mini course, you'll see in the next step section how to get a $50 credit to put towards the larger program should you decide to invest in that in the future. To purchase the mini program, visit my website at barebonesyoga.com, click the link for online courses, and select the mini course link. When you check out before you enter your credit card, enter the code podcast and you will receive the $5 off. I hope you enjoy the program. I hope it stokes your curiosity and builds your confidence. Namaste.